Yes, well, a former patrol boat commander warns there is no spare capacity of naval vessels to tackle the number of migrants crossing the channel. Tom Sharp has told MPs the solution is to curb the crisis and it's not at sea. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's kind of fair enough that really. I, I've got really, really grave reservations about sending the Navy in to try to deal with these uh, migrant boats, namely because I'm not sure what it is that they're going to actually be able to do. And I think the optics and the sights and things like that of there being two Navy warships in the channel and a yeah. little migrant dinghy sailing through the middle of them is not particularly good for this country. But, uh, but anyway, yes. Yes, well, Tom Sharp joins us now. Good morning, Tom. You served in the Navy, Royal Navy for 27 years. So why are there not enough boats and what needs to be done? The first thing that needs to be done is, is a solution to this it needs to be clearly defined by the government because depending on that solution uh, will, will affect the resources required to, to tackle this problem. Let's start with the fact, uh, as, as Patrick said, the solution to this does actually lie in land. It, it, it involves breaking the, uh, the economic business model uh, through intelligence-led disruption that starves the people who, who, who seek to benefit from this, rather like piracy off the Horn of Africa. It's really, it's really nothing to do with what happened at sea uh, with the solution. But let's assume that that takes years, is very complex and isn't entirely successful. People are still going to arrive on the beach in France. Uh, looking to make that final that final crossing. I think that's a fair assumption. Then you have to decide what to do. Do you want to stop all crossings? Or do you just want to make sure that nobody lands in the UK uh, under their own terms? Because again, that leads you to a slightly different solution. If you want to stop all crossings, then you need an extreme level of cooperation with the French authorities, some of whom may not want to stop those crossings. So it's, it's diplomatically very, very complex. Again, let's assume that that can't work that people will always get in boats, they'll always find a way, particularly if they're desperate, and they'll make the crossing. Now, at this point, the Navy has a role to play, um, and it has a role to play by coordinating the 20-plus agencies that are involved in this. It has a role in providing intelligence to ensure that these crossings are predictable and their locations are well known. Then it has a role in, in cohering the surveillance effort, and this is really key. At the moment, the surveillance effort is patchy, and it relies on on aircraft that don't persist, and it relies on radars on boats that are moving around at sea level. So it's all suboptimal, and it's not being well coordinated, which is why people are able to slip through undetected. So to me, one of the key things the Navy can do is coordinate a surface picture, which is what they do day in, day out, and ensure that nothing crosses undetected. And then at that point, mm. you meet them on the beach in the UK. Yeah. So really, well, the, the ship, well, yeah. for safety of life. Well, one, of, one of the biggest issues that people have, I've called the RNLI kind of an Uber service for illegal immigrants in the past, and I don't, wouldn't want to see the Navy being a part of that. But they're only an Uber service for, in my opinion, anyway, illegal immigration. If, like, if, if, they, if they reach their destination, their desired destination, and stay there, another option surely has to be deportation. It's one thing going, right, look, I wouldn't feel particularly comfortable not going to the... I wouldn't feel comfortable at all not going to the aid of a, a boat in the, in the channel. I, I wouldn't feel comfortable... Uh, just playing ping pong with it, basically, between us and the French until presumably it sinks. I mean, I wouldn't be comfortable with that. I would personally be quite comfortable with them coming here, they're being holding centres, detention centres, and a proper functional deportation system, because then you're not an Uber service. You're just holding them for a bit before you deliver them to a different destination. I think that's exactly right. And the Australian model shows that if you, if you process people with 100% accuracy, that's the first point, there's a tremendous deterrent effect to, to knowing that if you try and make this crossing, you're going to get intercepted either at sea or on the beach. Uh, the Australian model shows that eventually uh, the, the, the crossings dry up. So that's really important that they're, that they're, that they're marked, uh, watched across the channel and then met on arrival, no matter where that is, what time of day or whatever the weather. And then you're right, the processing there needs to be swift, it needs to be austere. I mean, we, we essentially, the UK needs a bad trip or advisor review in, in terms of the way it welcomes uh, the, these people, if that's if if we want to reduce the numbers, they get processed, and then if if deportation is the answer, then they're then they're deported. If it's if it's kept in the UK, then then that's it. But the key thing is that they're met and that no one arrives, uh, you know, undetected. Yeah, uh, and we do have to face facts, don't we? Really, we are a desirable country, we are a desirable destination, and we've got a very unhelpful neighbour, in a sense, as well, in France. Although I think if I was French, I'd possibly be banging the exact opposite side of the drum, right? So I have to hold my hands up to that. Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, we have to face facts, and this is, this is really the way that it goes. Have we, have we traditionally kind of maybe under-resourced 
Our Navy, perhaps? Could we be using them in conjunction with our military to cut the head off the snake and go after these grooming gangs as well? You know, are we reaping what we've sowed here, perhaps, in a lack of resources sense? Defence has been under-resourced now for, for decades. That's, that's no secret. Um, and the Navy in particular, every single boat it and ship it owns is, is in use. It's either on operations or, or working up to be on operations. So the person who has control of the naval planning process will be looking at this with a degree of angst. Because if you want to take Navy ships off task to do uh, this task in the channel, the very first question you've got to ask is, what would you like us to stop doing? And that's just a reality of our, our resources being being wafer thin. Uh, and same with the RAF, if they were to use airborne uh, assets, they have some fantastic uh, bits of kit to do that, but but they're in use. So again, what, what do you want them to stop doing? So yes, to an extent, this is a resource issue. And if we if we're to step up our efforts on the UK coast, as I've described, in other words, the surveillance improves uh, using uh, standing surveillance methods along the coastline, and then every single uh, migrant is met on the beach. I mean, that could be tens of thousands, as predicted in the summer. So resources inland are going to have yeah. to go up considerably if my plans to work, and that brings in perhaps the army. I don't know. I don't know what the plans will say. Well, thank you very much for joining us this morning, Tom Sharp, who served in the Royal Navy for 27 years. I mean, Patrick, I don't yeah. agree with your, your, your take on the, the RNLI. I think <laughs> as a, we, we, it's a bare minimum that if people are struggling uh, in the channel that we, we protect them as we oh, would yeah. hope would but, be done for but, us too. And so I, I, I strongly disagree. Well, no, I just, I just think if we, had a, if we had a deportation system as well that worked, potentially then we yes. would be uh, in a different situation. But we're moving away now. We're veering away.